Hi, this is Rob Dietz, Program Director at the Post Carbon Institute. Welcome to this special online event, Your Money, Your Life, and the Fate of the Planet. I am excited to be your moderator today. I'll be a disembodied voice in the background, and that's on purpose because we want to keep the focus on our, our webinar panelists. And before introducing them, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, for being open to thinking more deeply about money and its role in our lives, our society, and our planet, and for helping support our work here at Post Carbon Institute. Post Carbon Institute is a think tank that delivers ideas about how to make the transition to a renewable energy society. We're motivated by our vision of a world of resilient communities and localized economies that thrive within ecological bounds. Now today we're happy to bring you this event with our three distinguished guests. We have with us Vicki Robin, Grant Sabatier, and Asher Miller. Now Vicki Robin is an internationally known social innovator, writer, and speaker. She co-authored the bestseller Your Money or Your Life, which was first published in 1992. And there's a new edition that came out just this year. Her curiosity, insight, and adventurous spirit are traits that have helped her inspire countless people to live happier and more sustainable lives. Grant Sabatier is the author of the new book, Financial Freedom, which is available for pre-order right now. In the last three years, over 10 million readers have visited his website, Millennial Money, to learn more thoughtful ways of making, using, and managing money. Grant has become an inspirational source of wisdom on how to work toward a life of happiness and freedom. Asher Miller has served as the executive director of the Post Carbon Institute for the last 10 years. He's also on the board of Transition US. He's one of the best systems thinkers that I've ever met and a good friend. Uh, so let me give you a, a brief overview of our agenda and how this will work and then we'll hear from our panelists. So during the first half hour, uh, we're going to give the panelists a chance to express their views and we're going to do that uh, by uh, two ways. One, I'm going to ask each one a question and they will respond individually. And once each has had a chance to talk, I'll welcome all three of them to a short conversation uh, back and forth on what they've heard. Uh, after that, it's gonna be your turn. We'll have about 45 minutes of questions from the audience. You'll be able to type your questions into the Q&A box, and I'll be keeping an eye on the submissions and select some of them for our panelists to tackle. Now we have a, a pretty big group of participants. So uh, I apologize in advance if we can't get to all of the questions, but I'll try my best to select questions that, that'll generate lively and, and enlightening discussion. Uh, and then after the Q&A, we'll have about 10 minutes left for each of our panelists to, to give you their, their parting thoughts. Okay, so now the good stuff. Um, I want to start, uh, dive in with you, Vicki. Uh, Vicki, you spent decades helping millions of people think about their relationship with money and what makes life worth living. Why do you think these issues resonate with so many people and what have you learned through your own experiences? Wow. So I, um, those are four questions. Uh, so um, the first thing is about transforming your relationship with money. And uh, it's not so much about the money itself. I mean, we talk about money as life energy. It's something that you're trading the hours of your life for. And your life is primary and money is secondary. And so once you can make that shift to... Um, I, I'm a person who's up to something in this world and I want my money life to support my values rather than my daily life to basically, you know, like paw toward financial um, and profit. You know, not that money is bad, but just saying, you know, the values are our primary. Um, so, and why, why it's resonating with people uh, is 
I think number one, we, I mean, all of us have something inside of us that wants to express, at least, at least this is my view. We are not just sort of flotsam and jetsam in the universe. We all have things we care about, things we value, whether it's people, whether it's issues and ideas, whether it's nature, um, whether it's creativity, there's things that we really want to get out, you know, like, like to, to arise from our heart and show up in the world. And our money lives in this, this you know, hyper-capitalistic society, our money lives seem to get in the way of our life lives. And so the ability, this sort of the realization that if, if you use the approach that we have in your money, your life, to actually parse, you know, how much money do I need to have a life I love and realize that it's far less than you thought, that your expenses could go down and your income could go up and you could actually develop savings to free your time. That promise is, is so appealing to basically the soul, the psyche, like I can dedicate my life to something that means something to me. Also, I think there's a piece of it for me, the, where the penny dropped for me, we'd been teaching the program in your money, your life for a decade. Um, and then uh, in 1989, I went to the first major conversation in the United States on the Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future. And I sat there in the back having like taught this program for 10 years, uh, mostly to serve people who actually were up to something more than money and they wanted to liberate their lives to, to live their values. And I was sitting back there and we'd studied the people who'd done this program for 10 years, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And we found that by and large, if you pay attention to money in this way, that your consumption, your expenses would go down by 20 to 25%. Uh, not just like tomorrow, but you know, you steadily, do this transformative process and your expenses go way down and many people didn't even know what they used to spend the money on. So I'm sitting there in the back of the auditorium watching all of the <clears throat> commissioners of the World Commission on Environment and Development come up to the microphone, the heads of the major, um, the major environmental organizations. And fundamentally, all of them were saying that we traveled the world and we actually determined that the, the biggest driver of uh, ecological destruction is the level and pattern of consumption in North America. Consumption is the problem. And then they would like shrug, like, you know, you can't do anything about that. And I was sitting in the back and I was realizing, oh my God, <laughs> I, you can do something about that. We could actually, if, if, if I, you know, this is like the grandiosity of somebody who is younger than I am now, you know, if we could get everybody to do this, uh, then maybe we could actually shrink back into the ecological capacity to support humanity. And that sense that uh, the program that we had developed could actually achieve that big goal was incredibly motivating. And out of that came the, ability, uh, the commitment to write the book and to make it a bestseller, you know, not just to write it, but to do everything possible to get it in as many hands as possible. So that was the 1990s. I'm just saying that there is another part of this where, where people like this audience, people who are, uh, you know, follow PCI, you know, readresilience.org, this audience knows this fact. But, you know, we're trying to find the steering wheel that can steer us, you know, off this trajectory toward going off a cliff. And the knowledge that consumerism is one, you know, it's, it's like one gear in the gearbox to to make this shift. Um, I think that's also a big motivator, you know, that, that my money is linked, my money is a lean on the resources of the planet. And if I could get my, my, my money organized in a way where I had more than enough for myself and could liberate my time, I think it's a major motivator. And I think I've covered everything you asked, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, no, thank you, Vicki, for that response. Uh, lots of insights there. And to follow on that, I want to go to a share. Um, if, if so many people a share are hungry to find purpose in their lives, why would you argue that tackling climate change and these other sustainability issues that are hitting us today, why would you argue that that's such an important area for people to find purpose? Well, this is a really simple question to answer. I could do it in, 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 uh, in a matter of seconds, which is 
our lives are on the line. I mean, there's, that's what's at stake here, especially for those of us who are going to be inhabiting this planet, you know, 20 years or, or, or more from now. Um, now, of course, uh, it, there's more to it than that. I mean, but if you look at the, there's a recent uh, report that came out. Some of you may have heard about it uh, uh, in, in media coverage that was commissioned by the United Nations asking to understand, you know, from the climate science community, you know, wh what kind of impacts should we expect from uh, warming of one and a half degrees Celsius? And how does that compare to warming of two degrees? Um, which is, you know, the range that the international community has tried to land on, you know, and, uh, and then what are, you know, potential pathways to, to achieve 1.5 or two degrees. And it was very sobering and scary. And I got to say, you know, somebody who's been working in this space for a long time and, and, you know, connected with others who've been working on these issues uh, for a long time, you know, this report actually hit us in the solar plexus too, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, in the past, the, the internet, intergovernmental panel on climate change, you know, has been kind of this collection of scientists from all over the world, and they tend to land at the lowest common denominator in order to get consensus, you know, and so they, they're used, you know, they're used to being pretty active in, the game, um, in their, uh, I think the dog agrees with me. Um, and, uh, but they came out, you know, ringing alarm bells, you know, and, and they said, you know, in effect, we've got to reduce our, you know, carbon dioxide emissions by nearly 50% in the next 12 years, you know, um, that's, you know, that's just over the horizon. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, that could feel for a lot of people like, oh, this is hopeless. There's no way we're going to achieve that. Um, and, uh, and I certainly think that that's true if we have the attitude that we can't achieve it. Um, but, you know, no matter what we do in the next 12 years, every choice that we make now around climate change is going to have a dramatic impact. Uh, and not just on our lives, but future generations, you know, and, and particularly on people who've, who've contributed the least to creating this problem. I mean, Vicky talked about, you know, kind of American levels of consumption, you know. Um, we, we tend to contribute the most and, and are most sheltered in a lot of ways, um, or a number of us are. Um, so, but even, here's the thing, even if we could snap our fingers, you know, nullify the greenhouse gas effect, you know, change the laws of physics and chemistry and, you know, walk, you know, wipe away this climate problem. We, we have other you know, really, really enormous challenges in terms of continuing to uh, live life on the planet the way that we're currently living it. Um, and we at, at Post Carbon Institute tend to kind of categorize these as um, something we call the E4 crises. You know, that's energy, uh, the economy, environment, and equity. Um, and we see these as interrelated, uh, complex issues that require a lot of our attention and are going to require dramatic changes in and of themselves. But the way they interact is, um, is really key to look at and, and to apply systems thinking around. So if you think about energy, for example, energy is the lifeblood. I mean, you know, we could talk about money and people tend to think of money as the, sort of the driver of everything. And, and we do put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, investment in it and a lot of conscious thinking about it. But energy is really the driver of, of the modern economy. It's a driver of our bodies, right? And, um, and we've created an economic system that really depends on the flow of, of fossil fuels and a growing supply of it. Um, so even if there wasn't, you know, climate change impacts as a result of burning those fossil fuels, these are non you know, non-renewable depleting resources. And we've, we've picked the low hanging fruit of coal, coal oil and, and natural gas. And, um, and at a certain point, we can debate when that is, you know, the benefits of those things are, are, uh, are gonna diminish and, um, and we're gonna become more and more vulnerable. So we've got to transition our energy system no matter what. And because it's the lifeblood of the entire economy, our food system, transportation, housing, you know, uh, consumption of resources, all those things, uh, it's going to require us to being engaged in every level of society in the way that we live. Um, 
and we have, you know, other environmental issues beyond climate change, um, you know, other forms of pollution, topsoil loss, issues with fresh water. I mean, on and on. I don't want to depress everyone. Um, but, you know, there's, there's enormous environmental issues. And, and then we have an econ economic system that uh, requires us to consume more and more resources in order to support itself. It's really addicted to growth, you know, and, and because a lot of that growth is really dependent on depleting resources that we can't renew, um, there's a reckoning coming. And I think people are already experiencing that, and especially when you think about that fourth E, the equity issue. Um, what we've seen with our economy is that uh, the, the benefits of the current economic, economic system are going more and more to a smaller percentage of the population. And the rest, you know, and, I'm, and here I'm talking about the United States in particular, the rest are being sort of left behind. So the benefits, you know, of, of this economic system that we've created um, are actually not being, you know, felt by the majority of the population. Uh, and if we don't address these issues, we're going to be in for a world of hurt, you know. Um, so here's the good news, right? I was delivering all this bad news. The good news is that if you're looking for a greater purpose and meaning of life, well, there's no shortage. Talk about a growth industry, right? Like there is no shortage of opportunities to get engaged. Because um, as I was mentioning, it's sort of going to require a change in every facet of society, um, you know, from, you know, the food that we eat to how we move around uh, to uh, the things that, you know, the, the technology that we're using um, and on and on and on. Um, and of course, that could be overwhelming for people. So we tend to sort of, you know, talk about three areas of, of action that people can take and and how you engage in those really depends on your inclination and the resources you have, the capacity that you have. But, you know, one, and I think this is very acute for people, you know, as we have midterm elections here in the United States coming up, but uh, is acting politically, you know, being a, a citizen of whatever community you live in, that's, you know, your local community, the state, um, the, the nation that you're in. Um, so, uh, participating in the act of democracy is really key. And if there are, if you feel like the candidates that you have to choose from suck, then run for office. You know, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to engage and, and uh, because it's going to require policy uh, changes to, to deal with these issues. Um, so acting politically, uh, another area is to join what uh, Naomi Klein calls blockadia. And that's the effort of people to stop sort of the kind of the bad extractive economy uh, from happening. Now that takes lots of forms, but the first place to start really is around our own personal choices. You know, we participate in this, you know, uh, unsustainable and, and unequitable uh, uh, economic system every day. So the choices that we make uh, to, to support that or to block it, make a big difference. Now, there's other things that you could do if you've got the capacity to do it, if you've got the courage to do it, or you've got the desperation to do it, and that's, you know, civil disobedience and other forms of, of, um, of stepping forward and actually trying to block certain things from happening. Uh, and then the last, and this is the area that we really emphasize, and that is building community resilience. Um, and we emphasize that a lot because really the solutions to all these issues are around returning to being connected to place and, and community and people. And that means living lighter on the planet, you know, living within the ecological bounds of, of the ecosystem that, that we're a part of. And a lot of it really has to do with relocalizing where our food comes from, relocalizing our energy, relocalizing our economies and having a relationship with people. And the biggest asset that we actually have is our relationship with one another. Um, and so being connected to place and being connected to community and to the people that we inhabit that community with, you know, is a, is a difference between thriving and not thriving, frankly, you know? Um, so, uh, so as I said, I think there's, the good news is that <laughs> there's no shortage of places to find meaning and purpose and God knows the planet needs you to do that. Thanks, Asher. Uh, I want to, move to Grant now, um, you know, this, this is pretty lofty set of ideas, Grant, and it, it's, it's well and good to encourage people to prioritize, uh, say, meaning over money, to build sustainability and resilience, but 
most people don't necessarily feel like they have the means to do so. So what are some ways that you'd suggest they go about creating financial freedom in the space to do that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I think we both and we all really have a deep desire in our hearts to be free. And what that means to everyone is something different, but really at the heart of freedom. Um, a lot of us can make enough money to cover our basic needs of you know, housing, transportation, food, community. I think where things have run amok is that we feel like we deserve uh, this life that ultimately ends up requiring a significant amount of resources or requires us to spend a ton of time flying around the planet. And I think really at the center of figuring out how much money you actually need. Uh, and when you do that, you realize that you actually need a little bit less than you think. And then you can redeploy the extra money that you're making, for example, uh, into incredible causes like saving the environment. And I'll get to the practical steps in a second. But I had a friend recently ask me about quick investing question of, hey, you know, I want to invest in this target date fund uh, that's going to Pay, pay, pay out uh, in 2050, you know, I'm going to take the money in 2050. And it really got me thinking about, you know, what's the world actually going to look like in 2050? And it's not going to matter how much money you have saved, uh, or how much, you know, how many acorns you have hidden away, uh, if, if the planet is unlivable. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people with the increasing wealth gap, the people at the top are just hoarding massive amounts of money and they just make money to hoard it, to keep it uh, in their bank account, ultimately um, in an incredibly sort of self-serving way. And unfortunately, the more that I research climate change, I realize that it's going to disproportionately benefit those who have very little, uh, those in developing nations, those who uh, won't be able to afford clearly what would be increase in prices if there's a scarcity of resources. And so the people at the top are hoarding all of this. And I think there is a responsibility really for all of us now to turn our attention and realize that um, we're only going to be free and live lives that we love if we have a planet that we can do it on. And so my urgency around this issue has increased uh, exponentially in the past six months uh, as I understand what are incredibly dire circumstances uh, in terms of where we're headed from a climate change perspective. Uh, now to the practical, I really view money as two sides to a coin. Uh, there's how much money you're spending uh, and, and in your everyday -day life, your expenses, and then there's how much money you're making. I think uh, that you can really only cut back so much. I think a lot of uh, the personal finance world is focused on, uh, you know, kind of the scarcity aspect. But at the end of the day, um, there's many, many more opportunities, I believe, today to make more money than there are ultimately to cut back. But let's talk about cutting back just for one second. Um, I'm actually personally kind of against budgeting. Uh, I think that it's a distraction for a lot of people. I think it reinforces guilt. I think it reinforces a scarcity mindset. A vast majority of the money that you're going to be able to save uh, comes from three categories, housing, transportation, and food. The average American spends between 70 and 80% of their resources on housing, transportation, and food. Uh, so something as simple as moving from you know, a two bedroom apartment to a one bedroom apartment and saving $400 uh, is, is, is a quick way that you can save extra money that actually over time compounds well beyond just the $400 a month that you're saving. Actually, you know, if you're in your 30s or your 40s and you move from a $1,500 a month apartment to a $700 a month apartment, you think, great, I'm saving an extra $800. But that $800 is actually $9,600 per year that when invested over a period of five years, 20 years out, you have hundreds of thousands of more dollars just because of that simple switch from moving uh, from a $1,500 a month apartment to an $800 or $700 a month apartment. So housing, uh, you want to live in a place that you enjoy, but that costs you as little money as possible. Another way that people are doing this is through house hacking, which is the simple idea of, um, you know, buying a two or three bedroom or renting a two or three bedroom, uh, and then renting out the additional rooms to your friends, to family. Um, this is something that you don't have to do forever. That's one of these things with 
money. You, you don't have to live with roommates for the rest of your life, but if you do it for a couple of years and you're able to bank that additional savings, like I mentioned, that can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in investing returns over time. The second piece, transportation, and the third piece, food, you know, those are areas where, um, you know, obviously buying a used car, not buying a new, new car, the, the, probably the worst purchase that Americans make and they feel like they deserve is buying that new car, that thirty dollars or $40,000 car that they put on credit and then they have to pay, you know, $500 uh, you know, per month or more, uh, just just to start paying it off. So just buy the cheapest car that you can afford. Uh, just something you know, I can find cars all day long, even in New York City, for under twelve hundred dollars on Craigslist. Like I said, you don't have to do this forever. It's really, in my opinion, um, you know, the next two, three, five years. If you make some of these sacrifices, um, they really turn into opportunities because you're able to front load all of the extra money that you're ultimately saving uh, and, and, and get it to start working for you instead of you just having to work for it. And as I mentioned, these are sacrifices that you, you only really need to make uh, in the short term just to, to try to build, build your nest egg. Um, and then the other side of the coin uh, is making more money. So uh, in my opinion, it's never been easier in history to make more money simply due to the fact that there's such a broad and hungry audience online specifically, but also offline who are looking for information. They're looking to learn new skills. And one of the things I'm seeing every day is that people from all walks of life, from all generations are taking things that they love, skills that they have, uh, and they're monetizing them in so many different ways. And so uh, I know this woman, she's in her early 60s, and she's a uh, really loves sourdough bread. And this is a really incredible story. Uh, she really loves sourdough bread. She's been baking it for like her entire life. And she thought she was so good at it, she launched an online course for how to bake the perfect loaf of sourdough bread. This is a woman in her 60s. And now she makes about $50,000 a month off of that single course. And uh, now she's viewed as kind of the sourdough queen. And this is something she just did in her kitchen for fun. Um, the technology, the barrier to, to doing these things is just, is, is it's never been easier to do it. Uh, so you can find someone to help you set up a course online for a couple hundred dollars. Uh, there's so many amazing resources out there that make it a lot easier to make money uh, and monetize you know, your skill set. And then on the flip side, it's also easier to build those skills. And so one of the highest in demand skill sets right now is just writing. Um, so there's such a huge economy of people who want content for their websites or content for their blogs, and they're willing to pay between one to three dollars per word. And so this is one of the things, if you just enjoy writing, um, reaching out, you know, through networks like Upwork, connecting, uh, problogger.com has a great job board where you can get these writing gigs. And you can make between a dollar and three dollars per word in your spare time. And so from my opinion, um, you know, say you have a couple hours a week, instead of spending that trying to pinch your pennies and scrimp, you know, go and write a couple blog posts for uh, some bloggers or for some websites and make a couple extra thousand dollars that you can ultimately then invest in the things that you care about and more specifically in the environment. And so that's an area where an extra one to two thousand dollars a month donated to your favorite cause, uh, to, the, to the Post Carbon Institute, uh, to the environment, to your local community. I mean, that's gonna help in immense ways. And so being able to ultimately spend more of your time trying to increase your resources and ultimately increase your capacity to put that good energy into the world, um, I think it's not only an incredible investment uh, in yourself, but an incredible investment in the planet, which I think we're all learning that the Earth uh, is, is really an essential investment uh, for, for all of us to make. So the great thing about today is that there are tools and there are resources and there are blueprints out there um, that, that are paths to making more money and ultimately having uh, an impact while also enjoying a life that you love. Because I think that our deep desire to be free um, ultimately comes with a responsibility once we are able to make money to, to give back to, to our communities uh, and the world at large. Well, thanks a lot, Grant. I appreciate that. And thanks again, Vicki and Asher, for, for such a thoughtful opening. Um, I want to actually turn straight away to our Q&A because we're running a little bit behind the schedule we had set. Um, 
And uh, I want to remind all of our, our uh, audience that to, to participate, you can type in uh, to the Q&A box. Please use that uh, rather than the chat. Uh, one bit of housekeeping, uh, somebody has asked uh, if uh, we will have access to the recording. And yes, we will, we will make that available um, and send out a link to that after we're done. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's get you all going on some, some questions. And please, as, as our panelists are answering, for those of you in the audience, uh, anything strikes you, please, um, you know, please uh, type your question in. Okay, uh, this one comes from Susan, and I'm sorry, Susan, I'm going to broaden this just a, just a touch. Um, she asks, uh, in, the, in the book by Paul Hawk and Drawdown, you know, why, why do they fail to address consumption? Um, and, and I would broaden that to why do so many in the environmental movement, uh, you know, fail to address consumption? I think you touched on this a little bit, Vicki, in, in your opening. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, well, on one level, it's just a puzzle. When we wrote Your Money, Your Life, we really thought, you know, that, that the environmental movement would be so grateful that there was this book that helped people reduce the pressure of consumption on the planet. And, and there was no environmental uh, organization that cared one iota. Um, and, um, and I think part of it is, you know, behind consumerism is consumerism is like our shared religion. Like in 1992 at the Earth Summit, the first Earth Summit, um, George Bush the first said, you know, if we sign on to this, we're not going to sign on to it because consumption is the essence of the American experience. You know, and 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 I'm not just talking about America because we're exporting this. Everything we do through through advertising, through banking, through clothing, through everything, we are exporting a way of life that is a consumerist way of life. It's dangling this like shiny bauble in front of people and basically creating markets throughout the world for the products and the ideas and the way of life of Americans because that's the way to make money. So we don't really talk about the money part of it. It's sort of like, it's sort of like this thing that you can't question this piece of the religion, which is basically that money is loaned into being by banks. It's like the whole idea of fractional reserve. And I, I, I could go on and on about that. But basically <clears throat> money isn't just printed by the government. The, when you take out a loan from the bank, they only have to have a 10th of what uh, the loan that they make in order to make you the loan. And then the other, you know, uh, <clears throat> nine tenths is just created out of thin air by the pri privilege of being a bank. So as soon as you take out that loan, you, you're taking out a loan with interest. First of all, the money itself is a debt-based money. It must grow. If you have debt, it has interest. And so, the, so you have to get out there, make more money in order to pay off your loan. So the whole system is driving, this is what Asher said, I mean, the whole money system is driving this expansion. And, and, and we don't seem to be able to question that. Also, just take a look at, at um, the issue of the oil companies. And, and, you know, basically most of their, you know, balance sheet is, is still in the ground. And they must monetize that oil in the ground in order for them to actually even stay in business. So they're very unwilling to, to agree to not producing the oil that they have a claim to. The other thing is that money is a lien on the resources of the planet. You have money or you've gotten a mining right. There is nothing from the ecological system from which you are taking resources that has agreed to the fact that you can take these resources. So it's, you know, when you take a look at the energy system, you have to take a look at how monetized, what the role of money is in preventing us from actually doing anything about these issues. It, because there's, it's profit. I mean, one of the things back, you know, a decade ago when Asher and I were on the board of Transition US, you know, we were talking about the tar sands in Alberta. And people were saying, like, wouldn't it be great if the, the economy went belly up? Because that's the only way we're going to stop production of that oil. So, so we're not facing into 
the profit from this being made from the destruction of the planet. We don't, we can't find a way to insert something else in there other than regulation, which of course the current president is disassembling. We can't find a way in there. Um, and because all of us are, are, you know, I mean, we're, we're sort of like these little piglets and we're, we're like suckling on, a, on, a, on poison milk from a poison sow. But we can't get off that because it's, it's laced into everything. So you know, another example, um, which is something else, I also wrote a book about local food. And, and, and basically when you sort of drill down into that, you get to the, um, you get to soil. I mean, soil is the wealth of the planet. And there are perfectly brilliant ways to do carbon farming and actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil by rangeland management, rotational grazing, cover cropping, and you know all that stuff. But it doesn't make any money. You know, the, so, the, so the, the agricultural input com uh, companies prevent a solution from happening that if we were to have the will and deploy that would actually be one of the best interventions we could make to solve the issues or, you know, innovation. I mean, we're innovating toward, you know, you know, sort of changing the climate um, uh, equation, but all of it's driven by money. I mean, I don't mean to be like naive, but, but we have to take a look at um, that the religion that we share is, is, is capitalism, is, is consumerism. This is, a, you know, you take that away from, at least uh, talking about Americans, you take that away from us, you know, our tribal differences are immense, but there's one thing here in this country we can agree on and it's money. So it's so deeply woven in to our psyche, to our daily lives. And also just say one other thing is that um, one of the drivers is that you know, we're, the middle class is shrinking, but they haven't quite gotten it yet. I mean, there's still the promise that you could be one of the rich people keeps you from questioning the system mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like a lottery. You're going to continue to participate in the lottery if you think you can win. Hey. So, it's just, it's so intense. It's almost like, I'll just do one more thing here. It's like the old story about, you know, the guys out there, like, you know, at night, and a friend of his comes up to him, this guy's on his hands and knees, and he's patting the ground. The friend says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my, my keys. I lost my keys. He said, well, friend says, well, where did you lose them? He said, I lost them over in the woods. He said, well, why are you live, looking here? He says, because this is where the light is. So there's so many, this money part of the issue is like the keys off in the woods. And we're looking for other things that are doable, but you know, where the light is shining. Um, Rob, I'll just add quickly that I, I think, um, I think this is, I think Vicky's actually hitting on part of what the, has been difficult, I think for environmental organizations to address is that because it's so ingrained, as Vicky was saying, this is deep cultural, almost relig religious, like um, belief, you know, and buying it into a value system. I think it's been very difficult for environmental organizations to challenge that. And when we have an economic system that it requires us to consume more and more, um, <clears throat> and politicians who are, you know, are only elected because they're promising more and more of that, uh, and we've got a, a, you know, cultural values that are, that are ingrained around that. It, I think environmental groups have, have found it very difficult to challenge that. And, and I think that's, that's been part of the historical reason why they maybe haven't done that quite so much. I think what we face now is this weird situation where, because we didn't address successfully this cultural shift that needed to happen. Um, now we're in a situation where our time frame is so short and the urgency is so strong that I think a lot of environmental groups are looking for large, large scale um, shifts that don't require, you know, the generational change that, that kind of culture uh, requires, you know, and, and so we're in, in this sort of catch 22 situation. 
uh, that to me is not a good excuse, you know, for not addressing that. And, um, and so I, I would say that environmental groups need to do, frankly, a better job of addressing it. It's the elephant in the room. And, uh, and a lot of the things that we need to do to transform our relationship with money and consumption lead us to actually do things that are really healthy for us as people because we are social creatures, right? So if we stop transactionalizing everything, you know, um, and maybe we get connected to the food system by growing more of our own food, maybe we save some money, but we also build our skills and build our relationship to place and, and make our communities more resilient. Um, I think those things are incredibly key uh, strategies. So uh, even if they don't, even if it feels like it's, it's too slow going, I think we have to invest in it big time. Yeah. Thanks. We have lots and lots of questions coming in. So uh, you, you guys uh, just be ready. Um, so th this one is, I think, a direct follow on on what uh, what you've been talking about. This is from Lisbeth. And uh, she asks, uh, says that, you know, withdrawing from the economy also means harming it to some extent. You know, you're basically attacking that growth paradigm. And She's wondering, you know, will we be able to make a transition to a different sort of economy in a peaceful way? What models are available and how might this all look? Um, it's a great question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'd like to just jump in a little bit and say it's the S word. It's socialism. It's like, it's like it with with our you know and it's not pure socialism we can argue about that but with capitalism you know the returns are to capital capital with a more socialistic thing where basically the 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 costs and benefits are shared uh, across society because our government is actually uh, a mediator of well-being you know health education and welfare um that there's benefits to being part of a society i think that's really it's a, if we want to tackle something, I think that changing our minds about the benefit of being part of something, like Cher, you're talking about relocalization and, and being part of a community. I can guarantee that that's like 50% of my wealth is where I live and who I live around and what we do together. Um, and I think a piece of it is to challenge that there is something I'm noticing increasingly among younger people that there is sort of a society, the society itself is like an epiphenomenon of individual, uh, you know, choices maximizing pro benefit for me. It's a very Ayn Rand um, environment because there's not a lot of sense that if I invest in society, society is going to support me. There's like, we're losing social, a sense, a sense of the commons. We're losing a sense of the commons. So, I mean, that's maybe one place we can work. So I will cede the <laughs> book floor to somebody else. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, you know, we've been talking about this. There's a series of levers that you could pull. And I think identifying those levers ultimately that could have the biggest impact. And I think that, you know, you look at, say, the largest 500 companies in the United States, which, you know, are a disproportionate amount of the profit of the economy and getting even... 10 or 20 percent of those companies ultimately to put environment first as opposed to just being like oh we're going to donate x amount of money to the environment or you know there's, there's a big difference between clearly not doing bad and actually doing good and i think that if you were to get some of these large companies like the apple say of the world uh who could come and say you know what we have we're sitting on tens of billions if not hundreds of billions of dollars of cash we're going to put $50 billion into the environment. Just that lever, you know, whoever is on this, who's connected to Tim Cook and is in like his, you know, study group or something like that, that is your charge. Because I think there's a few key people where it's less about, hey, Mark Zuckerberg and all of, you know, uh, and Warren Buffett, give your money away to all of these causes. How about you concentrate a large proportion of these resources as well as your company and put the environment first? Because I think if you had a few of these companies that took that stance, um, A, it's incredible PR. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that would create, I think, positive impacts, not only for them, but obviously for the environment. But you just need a couple of those key companies that ultimately I think everyone would then follow in a way and then reward investing in the earth 
not just, you know, making money for making money's sake. So I think there's, uh, you know, uh, from a shareholder value perspective, a big company like that saying, you know, we're going to make a little bit less money this year, but we're going to save, you know, X, Y, and Z in the environment. So I think those, those key levers, the corporations themselves, if they can be turned, just a few of them, it would be a massive swell of, uh, you know, a, a huge tide turning. I'll just add that um, the question is a really good one and a really hard one, right? I mean, I think because it, it points to uh, one of the paradoxes that we live in, you know, and that is that we are, I mean, I think we all experience sort of this cognitive dissonance and, and those of us who are trying to, to head in the right direction are constantly faced with the reality that we're part of a system, right? That we're trying to change. So we make a lot of, of daily choices that it, that reinforce that system because we're part of it. It's really hard not to. And, you know, Grant talked earlier about like just being smart about where you're investing your, your psychic energy and your time. You know, if you're worrying about, and I do this all the time, you know, going to the store and, and debating about this product versus that product, which one is greener, you know, like having a little bit of perspective, where am I putting my energy, you know, um, and, and accepting that we are part of the system, but we're also trying to change that system. And, and so living in that, in that cognitive dissonance and that, that discomfort of trying to do these things that are kind of contradictory simultaneously, I think is just an important thing to try to remember and forgive ourselves about, you know, and be, and be smart about it. And the other is that there are lots of levers, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, there's so many places to find meaning and purpose. There are lots of levers, you know, uh, Graham was talking about the lever of trying to move kind of large, you know, corporate interests. You know, one way of actually trying to move that might actually be trying to put a price on carbon, you know, because that would drive a lot of people. Um, you know, th I think uh, I think it's about looking at the landscape of the economic system and the and the and the, you know, our relationship to it and our relationship to community and thinking about where can I actually have an influence and recognize that it's going to be part of it. It's not going to be the solution. There isn't a single solution to solving this stuff. And I think that. Um, and I can't predict, you know, the question was, are we going to have a smooth transition? I, I don't know that. All I know is that the more that we're aware of what we're grappling with here and the more that we act in a pro-social way, right? And that might be getting back to what Vicky was saying around socialism, which often could be construed as a bad word in this country, but acting uh, through giving, you know, and saying I'm going to either, you know, take less, or give more, or whatever it is, in order to, to for someone else to benefit, to have a faith that 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 is going to get paid back in some way, and and when we think about our investments and things, maybe the investment is not always what is the monetary return. It's like I get this return and that return and this return, and maybe the monetary return is fifth on the list, not the first thing and the only thing on the list. Yeah. I know we have a lot more questions to answer, Rob, so I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, thank you all. In fact, you mentioned carbon pricing in, in your answer, Asher, and there's a question on that that I want to get to in a minute. But I want to stick with, uh, with this theme for, for just a little bit. Um, and, uh, gosh, sorry, i got to scroll through and find the, the question that I, that I have queued up. Um, okay, yeah, this is back to the cognitive dissonance piece that, that you're talking about. And uh, Ed asked this question that uh, Grant, I think he's referring to your introductory comments that you indicate that saving and investing will yield greater money decades from now. But if we're heading to environmental crises, do you think the economic growth that drives those returns will continue for decades? So I think in other words, you know, is the kind of investing that we're accustomed to going to be on the table in the years to come? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I don't believe that we're going to continue to get historically high, or returns as high as we have historically. I mean, you look at the performance of the entire US stock market, it continues to grow, but the actually the actual inflation adjusted return uh, year over year is declining. Um, and so where historically you would have been able to expect about 7.2 to 8.2% inflation adjusted return on just investing in the stock market, I do believe that that will, that will go down writ large. With that being said, um, 
there's so many different ways to invest than just the stock market. And I think that taking money and reinvesting it, for example, like Vicky does within a community um, is an incredible way to not only build the community, but also get a return. And to, to a share's point, um, I think a lot of people focus on uh, kind of uh, the highest rate of return for the minimum amount of risk. But when you add in a third variable of impact and you actually lead with, okay, what's the biggest impact that I could have? And then focus on, okay, then what's the highest return I can get uh, for, 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 the, for the least amount of risk? I think over time investing in communities, I think real estate is one of those areas where if done correctly at the local level is, is, is a way to reinvest in your community as well as get a return. And so I think we're going to have to broaden our definition of investing. And, you know, at the same time, um, I do also believe that there are companies at some point who will step up and uh, there will be a correlation between the good that they're doing in the world and the value of their share price. And so long-term next 20, 30 years, uh, the companies that now are taking those risks and investing in the environment, I think will, will turn out to be uh, good investments, but that's a, that's a huge question. Uh, and I think that, that, that broadening how you think about investing, even in terms of investing in yourself and your skills, this is one of the things with increased automation. I believe that skills are going to be future currency. So a lot of people who focus their entire career on one defined skill set, I, I think uh, there's going to be a challenge there. And the people who are able to develop more well-rounded skill sets that are often counterintuitive, like being good at analytics and design, um, being data, being good at selling and good at data, you know, I think there's really going to be increased value in that because unfortunately with automation, we are going to have to uh, make money more as kind of little brands in and of ourselves and little islands um, and so you want to have as, as many skills as you can. And so investing in yourself, actually, I really encourage that uh, from a skills development standpoint. But you can learn a lot of things that are marketable for free on YouTube now. So um, it's, you, know, you don't have to go get a four-year college degree or get a master's degree now to learn skills that are incredibly valuable and will continue to be valuable long into the future. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, Back to that issue of carbon, uh, Paul asks a question. He echoes your thoughts earlier, Asher, that energy is the driver in the economy. He says it's obvious that we live in a true carbon economy and we need to put a price on carbon to steer us away from excess consumption. What's the best way to, to go about that? Well, that, that's, a, that's a policy uh, solution, right? There's the only way to do that. And I mean, the one maybe positive sign is, you know, that the IPCC report that I referenced earlier, I mean, that was the big takeaway from, uh, there, there are things in that report in terms of recommendations I think were problematic, but, but the sort of the, the big takeaway was we need a price on carbon, you know? And, uh, in fact, um, uh, the a person who just won the Nobel Prize in economics, you know, won it because of his work looking at putting price on carbon. Now, the price on carbon that he was advocating for, I think, is far too low. Um, so we could talk about what that the price needs to be. Um, there are different proposals out there that, that people have been offering. Um, I think, you know, there are pros and cons to them. There's, you know, proposals looking at, at putting a price on carbon and paying it back as a dividend to people. Um, there are proposals looking at, you know, creating trading systems. You know, there, there are different things and, and different communities are experimenting in different ways of doing it. They're doing it in British Columbia, that California has been doing stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think the way forward, you know, has to be that it's, there's uh, international movement on this. You need to have, especially with globalized economy, you need to have major players all being bought into having a, a shared uh, system of, of pricing carbon. The United States has to play a huge role in this. It just has to. And unfortunately, we're, we've gone backwards on that front, you know, and, um, and so it comes back to political action in some ways in order to get the right representatives, you know, um, in government who are going to stick their necks out and do this thing, you know, that we need to do. Yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, okay, and this is um, bringing it back down to uh, to the money issue. I don't know. My mind connects all these dots, and I'm not sure if I'm I'm doing it correctly or not. But it, this idea of thinking about carbon pricing, uh, I think it ties somewhat back to how money is is created in the economy that Vicky was talking about earlier. But anyway, I, I, let me get to this question from Ann which is uh, coming back to personal finance strategy. She says uh, that, or asks, in light of the upcoming reckoning of system overshoot, you know, because we're facing, uh, we're, we're using resources faster than they can be regenerated. She wants to know, how could you think about, how do you think about long-term financial strategies for retirement? given that we're in this position of overshoot? Uh, I'd like to um, do a stab at it because uh, I thought a lot about this and I actually included it in the update of your money, your life. Um, and basically um, what I've come to, I mean, in my own life, I'm not saying that I'm like a PhD in this subject. It's just like what I've observed is that money is only one form of wealth. And, and, and many things I say, as soon as I say them, they're obvious, you know, to everybody. I mean, I'm not saying anything radical. Money is only one form of wealth. Um, and other forms of wealth, like Grant says, your skills. And skills are like, building more skills is your capacity to be resilient in systems that are rapidly changing. So, so even just the, the skill of your capacity to learn um, to learn something new, to engage with people who may not agree with you um, in an enterprise that's going to actually create more personal sustainability for yourself. There's so many skills from psychological and personal skills to, you know, technological skills to farming and gardening. You know, the more you develop your skill base, the more resilient you be, the more able you are to be uh, to retire. The second one is um is basically your relation relationship network and this is one of the things about the consumer culture is that basically the whole thing functions on breaking bonds so we can sell products to people so, uh, who are who are rendered incapacitated because the person they used to live with is no longer with them and now they don't know how to fix their plumbing so breaking bonds and selling products is like one of the 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 voracious um dynamics of the consumer culture. So increasing bonds is one of the most radical things you can do. Um, and so, you know, just to, to do a survey for yourself is like, if you were disabled for two weeks, who would show up, you know, and bring you some meals or help you out around your house? What is the system in place that, um, that is personal and relational, not like social systems? But, you know, so basically increasing bonds is one of your primary ways to make it through the, you know, I'm 73, so I don't know how long I'm going to live. I could live to 100. You know, that's a long time for me to be personally sustainable. Um, and the third one is the, the basically, um, as, as, as a share is saying, relocalization. Find a place you care about and live a life that shows it. That's just like... You know, and you can actually look at the climate maps that are coming out, you know, from the IPCC and other places that are saying what places are going to be underwater, both financially and, and literally, and what places are going to be places where human communities can actually flourish. Or what places are distressed that actually a human community could move there, you know, places that are almost like ghost towns in the middle of the country. What places can you establish yourself and start to build an ecosystem around yourself of resilience? You know, that's skills and human beings and, or, and, and businesses, et cetera. And this is, also comes from my, my passion for local investing. You know, I'm investing in a lot of things in my community because I want local businesses. I don't want us to be high centered. I don't want to be like us be a retirement community that's ordering everything on Amazon. This does not work. <laughs> you know, so, so, and, and it's, it's just everything from the soil, the soil in your community, how rich the soil is in protecting your farmland. This is all part of, of making it over the long haul. These are interventions, they seem like they're so, so ecological, they're small interventions over time, you know, building, it's like building topsoil, it's just building, 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 building a, a richness of the, your local interconnected systems. 
Um, and so these are forms of wealth that don't depend on the money system and that do enrich you and others in a way that, you know, you can make it through. And then from a money perspective, just diversifying your income streams as much as possible. Um, you know, forms of passive income, uh, investing in things that people are always going to need. So for example, people will always need a roof over their heads. And so we've talked just a tiny bit about investing in local real estate, but um, setting up mechanisms where real estate, for example, um, at least keeps up with inflation every year. And you get the added benefit of a property that tends to like appreciate over time and you get cash flow from a rental income that will increase over time. And so just, just getting a couple rental properties, uh, even one or two, uh, over time, the net impact of that from just uh, being able to live off of that money and not having to draw down uh, or not having to draw down or worry about your stock investments as much, um, you know, that combined with hopefully Social Security will still be around, uh, combined with investing income, combined with uh, not looking past finding ways in retirement to make money that offset how much money you need to pull from your investments. And that's a simple thing that just making, you know, one, just making a thousand dollars a month when you're retired, uh, it reduces, uh, you know, the, the amount of money you need significantly actually from, from a, from a, from a nest egg standpoint, if you make $1,000 kind of just for fun working at home Depot or your local food co-op or your local garden center or tutoring, um, you need uh, about 200,000 less dollars to retire just by having a, a little side project. And so not, you know, not only will that, that keep your mind engaged, but uh, you know, you'll make some money and then you'll need less to live on. So doing that in addition to the rental income from a money perspective, you've got money coming from three or four sources. If one dries up, uh, you know, you don't have to worry as much. Uh, and I think that, you know, I recommend that, you know, even if you're, 20, 30 years from retire. And then the final thing is try to figure out how little you can live on. This is one of those things where I know I talked a lot about making more money, but it's one of those things where you're only going to understand your kind of upper and lower bound of spending if you test that lower bound. And I really believe that a lot of us, the things that we enjoy doing, like walking our dogs or hanging out with our kids or, you know, going and playing pickup basketball or reading a book, you know, these are things that are free. And a lot of us, you know, the things that you want to be doing are actually free. And so looking through that lens of if it comes to it, how little could I live on? And then building that into your actual uh, retirement planning, because, you know, if you have $2,000 a month in sort of variable expenses that you could pull back on if you needed to one month, having that cushion uh, gives you a lot more flexibility and freedom. And like anything in life, you know, it doesn't have to be forever. Uh, it's just in those situations where if you need to pull back, then you can. And that combined with the multiple income streams really insulates yourself. You know, you insulate yourself uh, from, you know, crap hitting the fan or, you know, something bad happening. Um, so that in addition to what Vicky said, I think those two sides of, of the coin uh, are, are really important. Yeah, thanks. And, and on that, uh, sticking with that side of the coin about, uh, you know, how little can you live on reducing consumption, Michael uh, poses the question about how can community and even specifically living in intentional community facilitate our reducing uh, our levels of consumption? Yeah, <laughs> I used to live in a, in a, in a group household. And uh, when I moved out and I, and I took the luxury of being uh, single and living alone, which I love, when I moved out, my expenses like went shot up like crazy because there, is, there are economies. So there's, there are sharing economies that you can have in a group household. Number one, the roof <laughs> and the, you know, and the basic like utilities, that's something that you share. And so, it reduces your, um, not only it reduces your um, costs, but like when I was living in that group household and we did an ecological footprint analysis, actually Matis Wakernagel came to our house and he did the analysis. Um, we were living, um, we were living a lifestyle at the level of a Mexican. As soon as I moved out, my 
my airplane ecological footprint budget shifted me way up to a lifestyle that was totally American and I couldn't do anything about it because I got into airplanes. So, so your, your, your finances and also your ecological footprint are really, really impacted by, by shared housing, shared gardens, shared everything, you know, but that doesn't have to be an intentional community. I think there are, you know, intentional community is great, but it can be very insular. You can live only with people who look like you and think like you, you know, because th those people have come together to form common cause. And, and I love, you know, just investing in my community, which is like, I'm, we're total red state, blue state island, you know, we, we, there's so much diversity of opinion. And so it really keeps me on my toes to like say, how does the world work so that everybody can agree on it? So I think the intentional, I think there's, you can add intentionality to wherever you live. It's a neighborhood in a city, it's a, an island, it's a town, it's, you know, so adding intentionality to, to reality <laughs> actually um, puts you through the exercise of how are we going to all flourish together um, in the coming years. I think it also extends into online communities as well. I mean, that's the really beautiful thing is that you can live intentionally through knowledge sharing. And, you know, there's just so many resources, free resources available out there from Facebook groups. You know, there are just so many where... Um, the, the, the resources being crowd, or the knowledge is being crowdsourced for you. And so, for example, if you really want to take uh, a trip to Europe and, and, and travel around, um, it's never been easier to do that literally for free. I mean, you can, you can get free flights from managing, you know, your credit card rewards correctly. That can be a slippery slope. But you can also go over there and you can stay on farms and trade your labor for free housing. Um, house sitting is growing. You can travel anywhere in the world pretty much now and house sit and stay there for free. Um, and those are things where those opportunities, which used to be really hard to find, now they're being crowdsourced in Facebook private groups and you know you can invite, be invited to those. And so if you just spend, and then from, from a resource standpoint, the ROI uh, of being at the grocery store and being like, do I buy this? Or spending you know a couple hours online trying to find the best price for anything, um, that's that's you're you're limited to your own time. But when that type of searching is crowdsourced for you, the cream kind of rises to the top, and you can can get incredible, um, you know, whether the lowest cost on anything uh, out there. There's even so many tools now that if you buy a product online, they'll monitor uh, how much you paid, and within 90 days, if the price is found lower anywhere, you know, they'll give you back the differential. You know, there's certain little tweaks that you can make with technology um, that, that, that help, help, you know, it's an intentional community, just at a larger, somewhat different scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for those answers. I've got a question from Dave and uh, Asher. I know this is something that's been on your mind a lot in light of us talking about how PCI communicates its messages. Uh, Dave says, he's asking, how can we have a civilized debate about and deal with the converging issues of, of overpopulation, depletion of resources, and the fact that climate change is actually going to shrink the, uh, the inhabitable land areas? How can we have a civilized conversation debate about that? Yeah. It it's a good question. It's a really hard one to have a positive answer to in this uh, current, you know, political and cultural climate that we're in. Um, I think it's one of the key questions that we have to wrestle with uh, because the truth of the matter is we can't go it alone, you know, and, uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to find commonality with people or else we are going to really fall uh, into into even more tribalism that we currently see right now that we currently see right now. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, and this this may sound frankly simplistic, but but two thoughts about it are, um, one is, uh, I I get the I get the tendency and the inclination to vilify. I feel it too. I get I get angry. Um, at, at people who I see are, are 
part of the problem. And that could be the fossil fuel companies. It could be, you know, politicians I don't like. Um, and I can get very mad and, uh, and vocal about that. Um, I think that when we do that, it tends to kind of split us into, into camps. And, and one of the, the messages I think we could try to carry with us is that, um, which is not a way of uh, negating people's responsibility for the choices that, that they're making, but the fact that we're in this kind of predicament that we're in is not anyone's particular fault, right? I mean, when you think of it from a larger, from a larger standpoint, you know, we are a species like any other species and we found an abundant resource and we went crazy for a little while and we overshot the capacity of the, the planets to support our, our habits, right? And now we have to deal with the reckoning of that. It makes sense that we did that. You know, it makes sense that that we have an inclination to kind of seek, you know, immediate rewards and, and, and discount the, fu- the, the, the consequences of the future implications of those things. I mean, this is sort of part of our, of our nature. Um, and so if we could try to remember that we're, we're all, we, we share a lot, you know, with each other um, and, and to try to imagine what the perspective is from, of different people, um, which gets to the second thing. And that is uh, asking questions and trying to understand where people are coming from without immediately jumping to conclusions about where they are coming from and what matters to them. And I'm guilty of, of constantly wondering why the hell do people not get that this climate thing is like, you know, this blaring siren in our, in our ear constantly, you know, how is it that people are ignoring that siren, you know? Um, But if I, if I stop and try to understand where people are coming from, what their concerns are, I might find that they're, they're taking care of an autistic kid or, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a parent or a loved one with cancer, whatever it is that they're dealing with, you know, that, that really makes it very difficult for them to be hearing that, that alarm ringing. And so that means starting with questions and understanding where people are coming from and then having the kind of the skill set to be able to kind of take that concern and connect it to these issues, you know? Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've heard great examples of people being able to do that. It's sort of this like, you know, mind melt thing where you're, you're able to really hear from someone what their concerns are and then put that concern into the perspective of the concerns that you have. Um, and I think like to, to what Vicky was saying, stepping out of our own comfort zones, you know, and, uh, and it's a tough thing because the more uncertain things get, the more we seek comfort. And that means we tend to, you know, kind of group ourselves uh, with people that are part of our tribe. But we actually, that's the time where we have to kind of break out of that a little bit. And we actually do that online too. So and the online might be a great opportunity to experiment with trying to understand people who think differently. You know, I don't spend a lot of time on, on ultra right wing, you know, political blogs and websites, but maybe I need to do a little bit more of that just to understand where people are coming from. Um, uh, so I don't have a great answer because I think it's, it's one of the questions we're going to have to really grapple with, you know, uh, over the coming years and, and decades, but those are the best thoughts I have at this point. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if I could just one, say one oh, yeah. That. yeah, I think, um, we're really helped by George Lake, uh, Lakoff and, and his, uh, idea of framing and basically to understand um, that we have a frame of reference that makes perfect sense to us. We don't understand what, why everybody doesn't share it. And then to be able to jump over into the frame of people who may be climate deniers, but that may come within a, a belief structure that is completely internally consistent, is not, you know, inherently, it may actually look racist, but it's not. It's not like motivated by, by racism. To be able to understand the motivations um, of people who think differently from you, then and then and then the values, um, uh, and to be able to map onto there might be like three values that you just absolutely don't share. You know whether it's right to life and right, right a, a choice, but there might be three values that you map onto each other, and so you can you can build conversations around those shared values. I mean, there's a lot of literature out about dialogue and deliberation. There's a whole network, the Dialogue and Deliberation Network, um, 
I created something called Conversation Cafes, which has a lot of intelligence about how to, how to do inquisitive questions with people who don't agree with you um, as a way to refresh your own mind. Um, there is actually every day, <laughs> I, do, I do cruise over to like um, uh, pages and, and websites that, do, that don't conform to my beliefs. I'm, I'm starting to call myself a Republicrat so that I can just get out of my own tribal, uh, tribal system. So there's a lot of intelligence out there about how, uh, how we can start to move across these divides without sacrificing what we believe in. So that's just... Yeah. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks to share. Um, okay, this is going to be our, our last question before I give you all parting thoughts. So uh, you, you certainly pay attention to the question, but in the back of your mind, think about what you want to leave our, our participants with. Um, this comes from Melissa, who uh, wants to know, what is the most impactful place uh, where she can change her investment in the current economic system? Is it energy? Is it food? Is it transportation? Uh, she's not talking about great sums of money, but she's in interested in what aspects she should change first to have the, uh, the best impact on, on climate and other environmental issues. Yeah. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I think the first thing is, as I mentioned, try in your daily life for example if you have a car and you don't need a car don't have a car uh is one simple uh in, just investment in your everyday life from an actual where you're putting your money um a vast majority of the investments that are offered in 401k plans in most companies um are investments that a are likely expensive and costing you money and and, and putting your hard-earned money in in someone else's uh, pocketbook and so the first thing I'd recommend is no matter what make sure that you're you're from a tax efficiency standpoint investing in a way and a fee standpoint in a way that maximizes the impact that you can have with your money and then the second thing is um, just investing in, for example, a total stock market index fund um, is, is um, probably not helping the world. And that's something that I'm waking up to and I continue to invest time into researching. But thankfully, there are more uh, sort of socially responsible mutual funds and ETFs that they may not be available in your 401k plan. Um, but they're, they're, they're worth calling your, your plan and petitioning your company to have more sustainable investments offered in your 401k and, and, and just at a bare minimum, try to invest in those, uh, for money that you have outside. Um, you know, once again, there's a big difference between investing in things that don't do bad and that actually do good. Unfortunately, those investments that do good, um, you know, you're not going to get a very good, if any, return in the near term. And so um, doing the best that you can right now and uh, really from uh, an investing standpoint, as you make more money and have more money, continue to diversify uh, in ways that, you know, you're not sacrificing all of your returns, but that you're able to um, try to help the environment in some way. Yeah, I, I actually would chime in here. I, um, I've i got uh, two investments in um, development of solar technology, one in the US and, and one in what I call the two thirds world. And I feel very comfortable with those. Um, and I'm, my return is six to 7%. So it's not, you know, it's nothing to sneeze at as my mother used to say. Um, and then also <laughs> one of my favorite investments at the moment is um, a company that has figured out how to, how to uh, finance grow lights for marijuana production. We're, we're saying what we're doing is producing CBD. We're not like the stoner stuff. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm making 10% on that, you know, with grow lights for large scale production of of marijuana for medicinal uh, purposes. Um, and so I, what I think about is, is like, I wanna put my money where what I want to have happen in the world increases. 
So I also have money, um, you know, and these are all, I am not an accredited investor. You know, I, I don't have the opportunity to invest in some of the larger things, but where I can find a niche, um, I will do it. And so I've invested in a co-op, you know, a large scale global cooperative um, coffee production. And so all of my investments are, are getting returns that, you know, are decent in this economy. And so just think about what do you want more of? I want more co-ops. I want more alternative energy. You could invest in wind farms. I want more uh, natural remedies. I, you know, just ask the question, what do I want to see more of in the world? And where are there opportunities to invest in companies that are taking a risk in developing that? I do want to caution, but, there are a lot of uh, predatory companies out there that are trying to profit on the increased interest in sustainable investing. And so, for example, like marijuana companies, uh, you know, if you, if you go out searching for the best one to invest in, often the ones that are being written about are the ones that are in that industry, the ones that are the, the, are the ones that are spending the most marketing dollars and actually not the ones that tend to be the best investments. And so I do see a lot of people putting money in bad places because um, where there's money, there's greed. And so I encourage you to, if you're going to invest, like in, in Vicky's standpoint, Vicky has access to uh, great information and, uh, you know, it, it does require some extra time uh, to, to research these companies uh, and to find the ones that at the end of the day, not only just aren't predatory, but, you know, if you, if you only have a little bit of money to invest in the future, um, you know, I, I really caution uh, against investing in some of these those types of companies just because um, they're so new, they're not fully regulated. You know, there's just uh, th there's quite a bit of risk in terms of putting your retirement savings. Now, putting maybe five to ten percent of your net worth into those types of investments uh, by all means, but uh, just a cautionary tale because I see a lot of people getting taken advantage of in that space. Right. Like swampland in Florida. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so the other thing I invest in is I invest in a fee-only financial planner who has, uh, you know, he has one of the highest integrity um, social and environmental screens on things that he brings to my attention and invests in. And so that's Very part of my investment strategy is, is it's relational. It's relational investing. And part of the relationship is I have people that I trust who bring me opportunities. I really trust. Yeah. I, I would just add one thing on this, which is I'm not an investment advisor. I, you know, and, and I think uh, everyone's circumstances are a little different. So if you're an accredited investor or an unaccredited investor, it makes a big difference. You know, if you are really concerned about, uh, you know, not taking risk is different than if you're, you know, uh, able to, you know, to take some risk. So obviously people's circumstances really dictate a lot. Um, in terms of question like food or energy or transportation, I mean, I think, again, if you're looking at near term, I want to invest in a publicly traded company and I want to be able to, to get my money out really quickly. You know, um, you know, you have to look at where where things stand with these industries. You know, the 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 clean energy solar, you know, uh, industry is is further along than the sustainable food you know system, uh, and um, so so kind of think about that. I I would say trying to invest locally. There are barriers to investing locally, but try to invest locally because of the, the, the multiplier effect of doing that, you know? And, and if I were thinking about trying to invest locally, and it may not be in a traditional way where you're investing in a, in a, in a company and you're getting shares, but it may be that you become a member of a co-op, you know, um, or you're supporting a local farmer, you know, by signing up to a CSA, you know, and maybe you're even doing something where you're giving them money up front, you know? Uh, in order to to be able to to, to do what they're doing, um, I, I would really think about those things. And if I was thinking locally, um, you know, I would probably start with food because we need to feed ourselves. We can probably use less, you know, electricity, and uh, and we don't have to, you know, transport ourselves quite the same way that we're currently doing now. But if we don't have food, we're we're really screwed. Right. And, and actually, one of the things I did is uh, some local farmers who are farming exactly the way I want, uh, I bought out part of their mortgage. Yeah. I bought part of their mortgage. So, 
Uh, I make money. They, they have property. Um, we have food. Yeah. Well, I want to take just a, a very brief moment here to express some deep appreciation. Uh, it's clear that our three panelists, all of you are on a journey and I really appreciate the wisdom that and the ideas that you're sharing from, you know, from the stops along the, the journeys that you're on. Uh, and I also want to say our, the questions from our, our participants uh, have been outstanding and show a lot of thoughtfulness. And so I guess we're all on a, on a journey of sorts. Um, we have five minutes left and three of you, I don't think I can do the math on how many minutes per that is, but just please take a, uh, a minute or so and um, and uh, offer your your final thoughts in light of what you've heard and what you'd you'd like the participants to um, to as a takeaway. Why don't Why don't we start uh, start with you, Asher? Yeah, I'll I'll try to be really brief. Um, well, first, thank you, Rob, for facilitating, and I really want to thank Vicky and Grant um, for contributing your time and your insight. Uh, it's been uh, really helpful um, for me personally, and, and I trust for those who were able to participate. Um, and, and I also want to add one other logistical thing, which is, you know, we're going to be sending out a recording of this to everyone, and we'll add some resources to that as well, uh, based upon the, the conversation we had. Um, I think the big thing for me is just, it feels like there's some, there's some real nice commonality or synergy between uh, what we need to do to sort of change our relationship with money and put ourselves in a position where maybe we're more in balance, uh, we are less stressed, um, we are you know, healthier and we're more prepared, right? Ourselves personally. And uh, what we need to do or have opportunity to do to find purpose, you know? And I, there's a bit of a relationship there, right? Less obsession on money gives us more time to think about purpose more time focus on, on finding meaning and purpose and, and well-being makes us desire things less, right? So there's a, there's a nice relationship there. And then if we, we, we think about freeing ourselves up to find meaning and purpose and experiences versus things, you know, and money, then God knows there's so much area to get engaged in, in terms of, it, of participating in this transition that we're gonna be undergoing whether we like it or not, and trying to do it in a way that, that benefits ourselves and, and most people and other species on this planet, frankly. Um, and so a lot of that to me is bringing it back to place. We talked a lot about sort of place, you know, relocalization, thinking about investing locally, thinking about, you know, property and land and, you know, our relationship to the food system and, and energy and those things. And so, um, when we think about investing our time, when we think about investing our money, uh, you know, I would really urge people to think about doing that in, in a, in a community, you know, and, um, and, uh, and there's lots of resources out there. We have them. I would encourage people to check out resilience.org. Um, we've published some books that are guides to looking at local investing and local food systems and local energy um, there are other great guides that are out there and resources as well, but but I really encourage people to think about investing their time and their and their money in their in their local communities and building res resilience. Yeah, thanks, Asher. Okay, Grant, your final thoughts. I think the big thing is, um, like I'll say it one more time, you know, there's two sides to the coin. There's cutting back and living with less, and um, figuring out how much money it actually takes to live a life that you love and figuring out how you can do that for less and investing in those things that give your life purpose. I also think the other side of the coin, which we often neglect is that money is power. Um, often that's used for bad, but it also has the power for good. And so don't sell yourself short in terms of taking on an extra job or trying to make more money because the, the power that that has to do good uh, can compound and amplify over time. Um, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. And so um, it's going to take some money to turn, turn this around. And to the extent that, uh, you know, you can build the skills and work with others and, and even better help others make more money uh, and, and then reinvest that back into your communities, that power, you can, you can, it's in how you spend your money, it's in how you make it, and it's in how you deploy it. 
um, and you have a lot more power than you, than you realize just in terms of how you're spending and, and also how you're making, uh, making your money. So that'd be my thing. Thanks, Grant. Okay, Vicki, you get the last word. Take us home, please. Yeah. Um, so actually, I want to talk about the level of consciousness, what actually goes on between our ears and in our hearts. Um, and I, I just personally that uh, in the last month, and I'm sure that there are many people who share this, I have just not been able to contain, uh, I've not been able to process the upset of what's happening nationally um, to a point where I could actually be um, calm every day. <laughs> I was just, I've just been swept up. And I realized that being swept up emotionally has actually um, increased my tribalism. You know, so it's like, you know, if it's progressive, yes, if it's, you know, if it's, uh, if it's Republican, no, I, I mean, I'm as, I'm as tribal as everybody else. I mean, I was because I recognize this and I've actually started this when my joke about I'm a Republican. I'm starting to withdraw myself from tribal allegiances uh, politically and socially uh, so that I can have a clear mind and I can actually see who's out there who might share that my perspectives and my values, not in a tribal way, but in a, in a pragmatic way and also in a soul way. Um, so I guess the thing I would say is, is, is to move yourself to the edge of your comfort zone and beyond to encounter with respect and, and curiosity and interest people who think differently from you. And so from a point of view that you can learn, that we are actually a learning society and we're gonna learn our way through this. There's actually, you know, like we're not gonna shout our way through it. We're gonna learn our way through it. And, and so every one of us can be out on the edge, not only of our own, you know, like supporting our own tribe, and I'm still doing that. I'm just not like head up about it, but also be at the edge of our learning. I would say that my relationship with Grant, I'm 40 years older than he is, and um, my relationship with Grant and millennials in, in updating your money, your life has like been a whetstone to beat the band because because so many things that are obvious to me and, and I care about are not obvious to him and, and he hasn't yet cared about them. Um, and so I am actually exercising that capacity nonstop in a relationship. Relationships, I know a lot of people now in this fire movement um, and I love and adore them and I'm learning like crazy and they're, they are giving me a great gift. So rather than how could they think that be like, Oh, I wonder how they do think that. <laughs> so that would be my offering. Well, thanks again to all three of you. Uh, this has been really uh, inspirational and, and educational. And I, I hope that we can continue uh, learning, as you say, Vicki. So thanks to, uh, to all of our participants. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. There's lots to think about. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.